Pesticide Action Network is, um, to tell you a little bit more, is the actual only charity in the UK that focuses on reducing the harms caused by pesticides and promoting self safe alternatives. Um, so today we're actually speaking about a particular campaign. So I'm Emma Pavinsasekati. I'm a campaigner leading on the Pesticide Free Towns campaign. Um, and so that really focuses on urban pesticides, which is a very specific issue um, and a lot simpler an issue in some ways. Um, so to delve a little bit more into that, most councils in the UK, so the vast majority really very much still use um, pesticides. They're trying to maintain this neat and tidy look that we hear about a lot on our streets. And so they spray, um, you know, to give you a little bit of a, a picture in your mind, they're spraying our pavements, they're spraying um, tree pits, they're spraying playgrounds, they're spraying um, sports grounds, cemeteries, basically anywhere where there's been a plant out of place, anywhere where we've seen a weed is where people are going to be spraying um, and maintaining those spaces. Um, but maintaining those spaces in what way? You know, what is the image that we're actually creating? As we stand, most of this is concrete jungles. You've probably heard that term. And actually, these are spaces that are devoid of life. It's pavement on pavement and, you know, tree pits that are tarmacs right up to the tree, um, which I know we'll cover later. Um, so really, that's the image that we're we're working with. Um, and to give you a little bit more of a sense of why we do what we do at Pan UK and why pesticides in urban spaces is a concern, is that these pesticides, you know, beyond their effects on these plants, killing these plants, which, you know, they're poisons, that's what they're designed to do. These actually have unintended consequences, but beyond that. So they are actually toxic and have a lot of harmful effects on humans. I mean, today isn't the space for that, but in a lot of our other talks and our resources, we go into these effects. Um, and they also have harmful effects on wildlife. Um, and something you know that I also want to reiterate that's coming up more and more is to bear in mind that pesticides are also a fossil fuel. They come from directly from that industry. Um, so our campaigning work really is there to work with councils and to work with residents who are concerned about these pesticides and to help them phase out pesticides from these urban areas and actually to create greener weed manage management plans in general. Um, really, the focus is that our cities need to be more resilient spaces in order to face the impacts of climate change, such as, as we know, uh, extreme temperatures. Last summer in London, it got almost to 40 degrees and flooding events, which this might turn into one here. Um, and, you know, more than that, cities also actually have a really important role to play in supporting biodiversity in the midst of our insect apocalypse. Again, a term that you've probably heard now. So really focusing on actually our doorsteps. Um, so, to really capture why we're here today, um, this is all about a new resource that we've put out that was really, you know, called for. We work with councils all across the UK, we work with residents, this is something that we realized is really lacking, is this knowledge of uh, the plants on our pavements, the plants that just grow naturally. Um, so our new guide, Greener Cities, a guide to our pavement plants, is there to respond to that demand. Um, so to quote a little bit, actually. While making our towns and cities pesticide free is a first step in moving in the right direction, we actually also need to appreciate and encourage more plant growth in urban spaces. So I already hear and I've heard it before the worries of we don't want to rewild our cities, we don't want this you know, craziness. We're not actually advocating for overgrown streets, we're not saying it's going to be an actual jungle, we're actually just calling for a nuanced approach where we leave you know, pavements clear for accessibility, but we also encourage wildlife in the right places. So the question we're really asking today is what do we want our boroughs, our towns, our cities to look like in this future or really in this present? Our cities can, and we, we believe, and this is why we're here today, is we believe that our cities can be well-maintained and thriving biodiverse spaces. But it takes attentive designing, planning, and maintenance for our cities to be greener, safer places for people and wildlife to thrive. So on that I think quite beautiful note. I'm joined by three wonderful speakers. So we're here with Dr. Amanda Took, um, Bridget Strawbridge Howard, and Sarah Cook. Um, so I'll go into their um, their bios a little bit before actually starting a conversation with them and really answering that question. Um, so Dr. Amanda Took, who actually contributed to the guide, she was the key voice uh, in terms of expertise in urban botany, which is actually a very hard. Um, resource to find. It's still a very overlooked area. 
so I think today is a really interesting um, opportunity to learn more about that. So Dr. Amanda Tuk is a freelance botanist, nature writer, and bird watcher. Since Amanda was awarded a PhD in plant ecology, she's become fascinated by the way plants survive on urban pavements and how enjoying pavement plants change how we see city streets. She's happiest walking around South London in search of plants and loves sharing her passion with other with others on her pavement plant walks. Amanda also con oh, yeah, sorry, also contributed her wonderful knowledge to our guide. Thank you, Amanda. So yes. Um, you can give a little wave. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so on to Bridget. Uh, so Bridget Strawbridge Howard is a wildlife gardener, amateur naturalist, and advocate of bees. Based in Cornwall, she writes and campaigns to, to raise awareness on the importance and diversity of, nat of native wild bees and other pollinating insects. She is also the author of the wonderful book Dancing with Bees, A Journey Back to Nature. That's Bridget uh, joining us. Hi, Bridget. And then Sarah Cook. Uh, so Hi, Sarah, is an associate landscape architect at Groundwork London, an incredible organization. Uh, Sarah joined Groundwork in 2019 and has over 20 years experience in the landscape industry. She has since led on a range of urban housing master planning initiatives and in a range of highly sensitive and challenging locations, as well as currently leading on highway sustainable drainage systems, or SUDS, uh, you might hear later on, on the Isle of Wight and the Kent Coast, uh, and working with, in partnership with planning authorities, water companies, and engineers to deliver these suds, as we call them, but always in these urban situations. Uh, her design flair combines a practical construction approach with minimizing long-term maintenance needs. So I think an incredible panel to have here today. I'm really excited. I think we have really fantastic voices to be able to discuss the practicalities, actually, of what it means to have a greener city. Um, so we're having a discussion format. I'm going to ask questions uh, of our great speakers and we will hear their answers. So first off, um, to all of you, and I, we didn't actually decide, but in whatever order we can go, maybe I'll just call out your names. What value do the plants on our pavements hold for you and from your particular perspective? And I think we'll start with Amanda as the resident botanist. Thank you, thank you. Well, obviously, I could talk endlessly about pavement plants, as you've heard, but allowing pavement plants to flourish can help keep our cities cooler, remove air pollutants and reduce pressure of the rainwater on our creek and sewage systems for zero cost. So I think that's absolutely critical. And personally, I value the diversity of pavement plants because they're a great reminder of the rich, diverse history of both our cities and our citizens pioneering, tenacious, diverse, fascinating. And if you start noticing them, it will really change the way that you see our city streets for good. It'll make such a difference. Mm, thanks, Amanda. Um, on to Bridget. Okay, so, so on a personal level, um, these pavement plants for me symbolize resilience um, and life. So I, I think they're the ultimate opportunists and I absolutely love that however hard humans try to eradicate them, they just keep coming back. And of course they have huge value to wildlife, um, especially the numerous species of insects that they attract. And added to this are then the, the, the birds, the bats, the amphibians, the reptiles and, and the hedgehogs who eat the insects and the slugs that are only there because of these plants. Um, and then there's with with many of the even the tiny little plants there's uh, with their prolific seed spreading there's there's birds like sparrows that feed on the abundance of seeds produced by them and and finally I think together um, they're greater than the sum of their parts because in areas where pavements span or the pavement plants span the entire lengths of streets they provide these invaluable wildlife corridors for creatures to travel safely along and um, to disperse in the same way I always think that hedges do and verges in the countryside so yeah there that's a really beautiful image I hadn't thought of that before um and Sarah and you're muted Sarah just to unmute yourself right I'm glad I've come third because I can just say ditto to all of that <laughs> um I agree completely with ladies um that one of that have come through the pavements and through the, the uh, walls and when you're riding on the train and you see all of the plants making their way through, you think, yes, they're very tenacious, they're 
you know, nothing can beat them, you know, however much we try, however much we build, you know, they will survive and they will, they will come back. So, um, yeah, I love to see pavement plants and plants hanging out of walls and buildings. I think it's, it's great, you know, to see nature just triumphing. Um, but yes, and I think they're really important, obviously, as well for all sorts of birds and insects. Um, and, uh, you know, and hedgehogs, etc, that that live in our cities, in our gardens, they need slugs to eat, they need insects to eat. Um, and yeah, green corridors as well. I think it's just connecting everything is really important. Amazing, thanks. Um, so it kind of brings us naturally to actually asking what variety of plants can be found in our towns and cities? Um, so a natural question for Amanda, of course. Um, and this is a bit of a, a space for us to hear in more depth, actually, of what are the plants that we can see. So we're actually going to share a little bit um, of our screens here so you can get a real idea of what we're what we're talking about, actually, when we talk about these plants. Can you all see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, so variety of wild plants in our towns and cities. Well, you are never going to run out of new plants to find. I think that's the basic message. But why is that? So if we have the first slide, Emma, please. Well, there is these are the sources of the kinds of plants you're going to find in urban areas. So obviously there's plants which are the flora of the British Isles and like this autumn hawk bit that we're looking at there. Um, there are also uh, opportunistic travellers, so things like shaggy soldier on, that you can see there, which is a plant from Mexico. Um, there are our garden escapees, um, like this beautiful hare's tail grass, which is a Mediterranean wild plant. Um, and then there are also plants which, so for, what you're looking at there is a planted wildflower meadow, and I say wildflower because most of the things, well, several of the things in there are not um, native to the British Isles. However, some of those plants will, having been sown originally, will become naturalised and will spread over the verges that they've been planted in. So, as I said, you're spoilt for choice and things to look at. You could be finding things from anywhere in the world. And there are also the most enormous range of habitats. And I would argue, perhaps controversially, that in urban areas, you're going to find um, more diverse habitats in close proximity than you are in rural areas. And I'm happy to be challenged on that later. Um, but these are the kind of places that you could be finding plants. We've talked a lot about pavements. There's a tree pit. So that's the area around a street tree. Um, there are the railway sidings and brownfield sites. Um, there are our urban meadows, in, in this case, in the cemetery, um, our urban woodlands. Our rocky screes, which in, in this case was as part of a um, car park, um, our urban cliffs, um, yes, yeah, so I mean bridges and walls, etc., um, and water margins. So all of those places will attract completely different plants and could all be found in a, in a tiny area within walking distance, for example, of my home in South London. Yeah. So let me share with you some of my favourite pavement plants. So this particularly beautiful little plant is the not so rare urbanised Jersey cudweed. So what do I mean? Well, many of us, you'll know that many of our wildflowers are um, under threat in the British Isles because of habitat loss and climate change. But this one is bucking the trend. So um, it, it's an annual in the daisy family, it has white woolly hairs, it likes dry habitats and it's adapted for that. It, it's found in Jersey, Norfolk and Kent, um, sandy fields, dune slacks, um, and it's listed in most wildflower guides as being very rare. However, in southeast London and East London, it's thriving and you can often find it on paved driveways, pavement edges and on urban walls. And here it is um, on the left in Dulwich on the right hand side in Shoreditch. So a beautiful little plant really worth looking at for because you'll probably never find it in a rural area. And another beautiful plant, look at that gorgeous thing. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Look at that colour. So this is really saxifrage and I, I think this is fantastic urban opportunist. 
So if you think of the way that, for example, in Birdland, that peregrine falcons have made use of our um, city buildings as a sort of replica for their life on coastal cliffs, um, really saxifrage is doing something similar in the plant world. So it's um, it's a plant that in the in sort of outside of cities like sand dunes and lime, limestone rocks. So in cities, it's very happy growing on city walls, cobbles, which are built with limestone mortar. Um, and at, it, early in the spring, you can see the um, the walls, the Thames wall um, in Southwark area, completely covered um, with a mat of red and these gorgeous little flowers. So what you're looking at there is a flower that's um, sort of three or four centimetres high. Um, but it's a lovely thing. Look out for it. Definitely worth doing a Thames walk just so you can see that. And my third pavement star is um, Oxford ragwort. You, you couldn't talk about urban plants without talking about Oxford ragwort, which is an extraordinary urban traveller. So it's a plant that grows naturally on sort of volcanic gravel of Mount Etna in Sicily. Um, it was first spotted in the Oxford Botanic Gardens in the 1700s. It escaped from the garden, from the, the Oxford Botanic Gardens, spread along Oxford city walls, had reached the railway station by the 1830s. Um, people at the time reported seeing railway carriages absolutely filled with its fluffy seeds floating around. And it made use of that railway to spread. So it, it reached London by train, we could say, by, by the late 1800s um, and the west and east of England um, by the, as, as we reached the turn of the century. By World War I, it was in Scotland and it was in, by, um, in World War II, it was in Wales. So it, it moved incredibly fast. Um, it's now common in most urban areas in the British, British Isles, and rather like its cousin, common ragwort, it's very attractive um, to invertebrates, flying insects, um, pollinators. Um, so it is really valuable and um, really worth appreciating. It looks very similar to our common ragwort, but you can see on, on this picture, it has little black dots on, around flowering heads. So that's one way of distinguishing it from our, our common native plant. So are there any pavement plants that cause problems? That's something that people often ask me. Um, yes, but not very many, I think is the bottom line. Most of our pavement plants are annual um, pioneering plants, but there are a few that are perennials. Um, and these are some examples. Um, so look at that picture at the top. Budlia has beautiful flowers. I grant you that. Um, if you love butterflies, you possibly have a buddleia or a variety of cultivar of buddleia in your um, garden, um, and I'm sure you love the butterflies it attracts. However, it does the most enormous amount of damage to water um, and pulls down walls and um, rail companies spend a huge amount of money um, having to clear it from what railways. So um, the next one, um, bottom left. Tree of Heaven, or perhaps it should be called Tree of Hell, um, but it grows incredibly fast. Um, it has very sort of what was seen as being very attractive leaves and so has been planted in lots of gardens, um, but it does spread like mad. And here it is growing in Deptford. Um, I'm not even sure these people knew uh, who owned this um, sort of garage area even knew what that plant was and probably it appeared in a couple of years. And then finally, um, Oh, somebody's just asked a scientific name, it's Ilanthus altissima. Um, and then on the bottom right hand side, um, black locust tree. Um, so that, that tree, that sapling there appeared during lockdown. Um, so possibly it'd only been there sort of three or four months, grows incredibly fast. And black locust is a tree that's commonly um, planted as a street tree. Um, so it's just something to keep an eye out for. So there aren't many plants that are a problem on pavements. The ones that the things that they tend to have in common, they tend to be woody perennials like the ones we're looking at here. They tend to come from far flung places, often introduced by gardeners. Um, and because they come from far flung places, and in the case of Budleia and Tree of Heaven, they're both from Southeast Asia, Black Locust is from the Americas. Um, they don't tend to have their suite of herbivores and insects with, which would normally suppress their growth in their in their native countries. Um, so that can be a problem. But as I said, um, there are very few of them that cause those sorts of problems. 
most pay from plants are small annuals. And then finally, so all of this adds up to incredibly happy urban botanists. So here, here I am at botanizing with a whole range of different people. The top left was a group of us who um, were botanizing on New Year's Day because one of the fabulous things about looking for plants in cities is, is the urban heat island effect, which means that most city areas are five degrees warmer than next um, areas around them. Um, we tend to, in the cities, you can find lots of um, wild plants in flower, even on New Year's Day. Um, so there we were on the on the Thames South Bank um, hunting for plants um, and which we can pretty much do every day of the year. So I really recommend it. Get out there, go and look for some plants, find out what plants grow in your street, find out what plants grow in the next street. Um, and you'll never run out of amazing things to look at from all over the world. And I shall probably stop there. Thanks, Amanda. That's incredible. I love hearing the stories of plants from, yeah, sort of that you wouldn't expect in a city, especially the rare plants that sort of end up being there and completely changing this narrative or the stories of, you know, a plant that actually, a pavement that actually replicates a space that would have been a natural space somewhere else and starting to think of our cities in that much more, you know, natural way, actually, like, you know, wall is just a tiny cliff and, you know, starting to really think, yeah, think less of nature being out there and think of it as being here as well. Mm. Um, and sort of in that light, uh, you know, there's this very human approach to what I'm saying, actually, of, you know, thinking of these plants for our own beauty. And, and in a way, we heard of how great they are for botanists. But now we can hear from Bridget of how great they are for wildlife. Um, you know, and we see all these plants, uh, yeah, sort of growing in spaces where uh, that used to be natural or however we want to call it. Um, but actually insects are here too, and they also need things to, to survive on. So I will again share my screen and we can hear about all these insects that are surviving um, just about in our, in our cities as well. Um, there we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Perfect. And I will large screen that. Ironically, I'm always the worst. Uh -huh. There we up go. A slides, uh, up a couple of slides. Oh yeah, sorry. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so of course, it's very commonly known that that bees visit flowering plants for pollen and nectar, um, but other insects and wildlife in general also visit um, for other reasons, including next slide, including refuge. So we've got here on the left. This is a a beautiful shield bug um, nymph. And I see a lot of these hiding and coming out um, from, from the rain and uh, early in the morning from, from red campion and seed heads. So, um, and then top right is ladybirds and the ladybirds hibernate. They sort of hibernate just as the leaves start to furl up. I often find ladybirds sort of getting ready for their winter hibernation. So, so that's the refuge and also for warmth, lots of the insects um, visit, uh, especially earlier in the season, plants radiate warmth and, and sort of bumblebees when they first come out of hibernation, you often find them sort of just taking refuge, a little bit of extra warmth in plants. And then bottom right the photograph I've got here um, is, is also um, insects and other creatures like spiders visit flowers to, uh, to, to basically to catch their prey. So this is a crab spider ambushing some poor um, fly species there. So yeah, so so not just pollen and nectar, of course, pollen and nectar is hugely valuable. So next one, please, um, Emma. Now, the other thing that, that many of our urban butterflies and moths rely on these plants 100% for is for the whole of their, 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 their life cycle. So this is, here is the mullen moth, and you can't see there's, there's nothing left of, um, of what it's been munching on the right but as well as as using mullen they also use figwort and figwort is a plant that's often you'd, you'd find it growing along waterways along the sides of canals um, also a very valuable plant for some of our other um, insects like wasps have a, a particularly attracted to to figwort and lots of our shorter tongued insects and then the next slide um so we've already mentioned this is not Oxford ragwort. This is just common ragwort, but ragwort. And I, I, I photographed this um, in a car park in Liscard last weekend. 
And and again, it's just absolutely fantastic. So, of course, for the cinnabar, well, not of course, but for the cinnabar um, moth, which lays its eggs and whose caterpillars munch um, on the ragwort leaves. But also it's very attractive to a lot of pollinating insects. And you can see here, this is a leaf cutter absolutely covered in ragwort pollen about to take it back to her nest. So ragwort again, um, absolutely invaluable. And especially I think in, in urban areas because um, it, it's safer there um, for people who are worried about the safety issues um, around ragwort. So next one. Uh, the, so, uh, so I've got a photograph. This is this is Rose Bay willow herb on the left, but all of the willow herbs and some of them are absolutely minuscule, um, are, are just magnets for not just bumblebees as we've got on the left, but lots of our solitary bees and um, hoverflies and smaller insects. And they're also the food source for elephant hawk moth caterpillars. So, so, and I, I've actually seen the caterpillars on the willow hives, which is uh, a sight to behold. I haven't got any photographs, sadly. And then next one, I'm coming on now to solitary bees. So, so um, solitary bees, I, uh, solitary bees, and and there are, ah, uh, oh, there, there are more solitary bees than any other bee species um, in Britain and Ireland. Um, so, so solitary bees, especially some of the smaller species don't fly far between their nesting areas, which could be in cavities in, in walls or, or in the ground and their foraging sources. So it's absolutely vital that these, these bees are reliant 100% on the plants to be flowering when they emerge. And they've already got enough problems with plants and insects being a little bit out of, out of sync with climate change. So, so if the plants are just not there because they've been eradicated, it's, it's a huge problem. And if the plants are there, these, these insects flourish. And if they disappear, so do the bees that rely on them. Um, and there are so many different plants that are just amazing for bees. Um, and, and many of our native bees have co-evolved with some of our native wildflowers. So, so especially, unlike the generalists, um, the, these, these more specialist bees um, are quite fussy about their pollen source. So this is another reason why if, if it's a native wild um, flower in an urban setting, it's even more important that we, we do whatever we can to protect them rather than eradicate them. And I just want to now shout out, give a shout out for a couple of, um, not just my favourite, but the bees' favourite plants. So next one dandelions um so dandelions my goodness you know so not only do they flower at a time when uh th there's a gap there, there are gaps when they start to flower but but when they flower if allowed they flower in abundance and each flower is is actually not just one flower but many florets in the same um flower head on the same stalk so for the bees not only do they supply uh, a great source of pollen and nectar but they provide easy foraging because the bees don't need to use much energy. You know, they can just sort of dip in and out of all these different florets on top of the one dandelion head. And you've got here, top left is um, the ashy mining bee that nests in the ground. Bottom left is a common card of bumblebee. Um, bottom right is, um, I don't know its common name, but Andrina nitida. And I can't remember which the, the top right one is, but they're all covered in pollen. It's a great plant. Um, so make friends with dandelions if you can. And the next plant that I didn't realize until a couple of years ago, how um, incredible yarrow, this is yarrow, is for diversity of visiting insects. And the, the bottom left is a solitary bee, top left is a hoverfly, um, bottom right um, a fly, and I can never pronounce, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the insect top right. But these are, I went around photographing insects visiting yarrow, um, in a one hour space and photographed 13 different insects. So, so yarrow, if it grows, is, is again, one to, one to just respect and, and protect. Um, and then this next plant, I, I chose this. So difficult to know which plants to choose and which to leave out, there's so many of them. But this is, and correct me, I'm not a botanist, so correct me if I'm wrong, but black medic which is the tiniest, most inconspicuous flower you've ever seen in your life. And I have to put glasses on actually to see it. But this is this is an equally tiny solitary bee. This is a, 
um, a blood bee. It's um, a bee that lays its eggs in the nests of other ground nesting solitary bees. But I've seen many different small, tiny solitary bees feeding on this plant. So, so this is another of my, my new favourite plants. Um, and the next slide. So we, yeah, so we, we've already, um, Amanda's already mentioned problem plants. So I photographed all of these plants. So top left is red valerian, top right buddleia, bottom right ivy, and bottom left um, bindweed, all, all considered to be um, problem plants for one reason or another. And what I was thinking, because I know that the, 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 the red valerian falls into the same category as the buddleia, it, it, um, it is invasive, it, it seeds profusely, and when it takes a hold, it does cause problems to infrastructure. But where it has taken hold, and most of these photographs are again taken in car parks, um, that the bees and other insects have come to rely on it. So with, with the um, red valerian and the, the buddleia, um, that they're actually really, really good. The red valerian for, for, for insects like the hummingbird, hawk moth and other long tongued insects. So I just think it's really important if they, of course, to pull them out in areas where they're inappropriate and they're going to cause damage. But maybe there will be areas in in towns and cities um, that where the infrastructure doesn't matter so much that they could be allowed to remain for those insects that rely on them. And in areas where they uh, are inappropriate, perhaps plants could be allowed that also uh, suit these long-tongued insects. And then ivy, of course, um, uh, this is an ivy bee, bottom right. Um, ivy, you can hear the ivy at the end of the season when it flowers. It's it's just the most extraordinary plant for, for pretty much every insect that's still around uh, in the autumn. Um, and bindweed, again, bindweed is, is, you know, if you can't make friends with your dandelions, um, maybe make friends with a bindweed or vice versa. And then just the last... Um, slide so i've included this um so so many of our ground nesting bees i know we've just come out of no mo may um actually that was two months ago it's july now isn't it but it's also very important to leave there's there's lots of areas often um little verges near um near car parks and supermarkets um, and areas in particular where, where councils have planted municipal plants, things like viburnum. And, and if you see little mounds like this, tiny, tiny little mounds like this, this is evidence of there being not a colony because solitary bees are not, um, not social, but an aggregation of ground nesting bees. These are lots of single ground nesting bees that nest and they don't fly very far, you know, between... Um, their nesting area and the plants they forage on. So these areas as well, these, these sparsely vegetated, closely mown areas um, are really important to, to, to again, to, to, to protect. Um, so I think that's, um, I think that's me. I'm going to, um, yeah, that's me. I'm going to end there. Um, so difficult to know what to leave out, but thank you. <laughs> That's incredible, Bridget. It's also really fun to see how it links up with Amanda's plants and to see what it actually feeds. But more, I mean, almost in an awesome way, just to see how many insects depend so intricately on one particular plant or the needs that they have of, you know, a long trunk then needs a, a long stem. And yeah, all this incredible intricacy that actually I think it just reminds me how much you know, this hubris of thinking that we can completely replace that, um, you know, just the, and the importance, I mean, we'll, we'll come on to it with Sarah of actually making space for those for those plants and for that biodiversity and making space for that for the unknown in a way, you know, for to be able to find that yarrow and, and to see that actually, wow, yeah, 13 species have come to visit it in an hour and the unexpected there. Um, yeah, and, and just briefly on, again, this sense of connecting those those corridors, connecting those spaces and, and connecting it through time as well, which, again, I, I know we'll touch upon, but I think those are really important things that we don't always think of. You know, we think of connecting spaces and connecting streets, but we don't always think of connecting seasons, right, that things will flourish at different times. Um, but I think we're, I don't want to encroach too much on, on Sarah's uh, presentation or uh, answer to this question of how do we actually design more biodiversity and, and diversity into our towns and cities? You know, what can we practically do? Um, 
So Sarah, are, yeah, you're sharing your own screen, right? Yes, yes, yes I am. I will share. A very um, a practical go. question for you of okay. how do we make this happen? Is there a way to have Budlia somewhere? Is there a way to have Ivy somewhere in our cities that isn't going to create a problem for our infrastructure? Some gentle questions for you to attempt to answer, um, which I'm sure many people want to know about. Okay, sorry, you were breaking up a little bit there. Um, I have some slides to show, um, not as beautiful as Bridget's. What lovely pictures, Bridget, they were gorgeous. Um, but yes, we do need to make space for plants in our cities. We need to to actively make, make space and not just leave them to grow through the pavement. So the best thing that we can do is take pavements up, take up the gray space and turn it to green wherever we can. So if we depave areas of road and pavement, we provide multiple benefits for wildlife, for people. Um, depaving roads and planting trees allows us to link green spaces and provide connectivity. Low level planting filters out particulates from vehicles and exhausts and provides a buffer between people and traffic, which in turn creates greener, healthier and more biodiverse streets. So a couple of slides to illustrate what can be done. So the first slide here, this is Churchway Estate in, um, this is near King's Cross. Um, obviously a very hard paved courtyard initially with no wildlife whatsoever and, and no, no opportunistic plants coming through at all that I can see. Um, so we pulled up the paving and we created space for plants for wildlife and a much better space for people, I think you'll agree. Um, this is another example of where we've depaved. Uh, we depaved here for a few reasons. Um, one of them was uh, flooding. So this area used to flood, as you can see, really not a very nice space at all, a little bit of green on the outside. So we've um, made a, a suds here, which is, a, sorry, I'm getting, tongue-tied sustainable drainage system so this will take water off of the hard surfaces and in some cases on this estate we've also disconnected down pipes from the roofs so water that would have flooded into the combined sewer systems and inundated it will now go into these sustainable drainage systems um, and be slowed down before it goes into the combined sewers we can also add green roofs we can put them on on new development so a lot of new developments now there's a requirement for as much green space as possible to be retained and one way when you're building a building to retain green space in that building's footprint is to provide a green roof on the top of it these are some that we retrofitted in flora gardens in hammersmith and these now um, provide lovely wildlife habitats for all sorts of plants and also insects. Um, also helps to, to slow down the rainfall and to absorb some of the rainfall and stop um, some of it reaching the ground. So I think this is an all round win. Uh, green roofs also um, help to mitigate the urban heat island and they provide lots of good habitats and they also um, insulate the buildings, which means you're not using as much energy to heat your buildings, which is also a win, I think. So here's a couple of other green spaces. Well, this is a green space, not a very diverse green space on the same housing estate, Queen Caroline Estate. Big tree, lots of grass, not really doing much at all for anything. So, and also subject to flooding. So this is a before picture after we've increased biodiversity and flood attenuation. These are swales. This little channel will take rainwater off of uh, adjacent hard surfaces and bring it into the swale. So we've got lots of, lots of nice planting um, and we've got a better environment for children to play. We've got higher biodiversity and we've got flood attenuation and space for wildlife. The other thing we can do is plant trees. Um, so choosing the right tree species is important, but also increasing the diversity of trees that we plant in our streets is important. Um, obviously, some trees are better for others than others for supporting wildlife. And the oak has roughly 
2,300 species associated with it, uh, whereas ginkgo has about four. So there's, you know, choosing the right plant is important, choosing the right tree, um, making sure you've got berries for birds and flowers for early pollinators is important, but also planting the trees in the right situation. So making sure the tree pit isn't, as, uh, as the other ladies mentioned, just in tarmac that sort of rises up around it as the roots start to spread. Um, properly designed tree pits are really important. Tree pits with structural soils, tree pits with aeration pipes, tree pits that link one tree to another tree within the street in, with a containment system. It helps the trees to thrive, it helps them to connect to each other, and it supports the tree's health, not only above ground, but underground. So you have your mycorrhizal connection between the trees, which helps the trees support each other in times of stress. So you're helping the trees stay healthy and you're uh, minimizing maintenance because if the trees are planted properly in the right situation, in the right conditions, then they will thrive and you will not have to keep replacing them or chopping them down and taking off dead branches. Um, so that's, I think, important. Um, we also talked about rain gardens in streets. So if we can start to put rain gardens into streets, we can not only attenuate for flooding, we can create biodiversity and much healthier streets for people to exist in as well. So when, the, uh, when we get a lot of rainfall, the combined sewer system gets overloaded and that's when you get your sewer um, discharge into the rivers and the oceans. So in putting rain gardens in towns, mitigating for those flood events, we're also protecting um, river and ocean wildlife as well. So it's, you know, it's a no brainer. I think it's something that really needs to be rolled out as much as possible. Um, so this is Newport High Street. This is what it does look like. This is what it will look like. So fairly shortly. Um, these are some other examples of depaving. This is Enfield and this is Sheffield Greater Green. Um, so lots of rain gardens. This looks a lot prettier. I think this was taken on a, a sunnier summer's day. So we have lots of biodiversity, lots of different flowering plants. The Enfield scheme was also really interesting. They had um, taken one previously buried river uh, in Enfield and they'd opened it up. And in one of the parks, so these, um, these rain gardens connect to parks, basically it's a greenway, and they've taken the river out of its, its conduit, they've opened it up and created wetlands, and then at the end of the park, they've put rain gardens in the roads, and these rain gardens go all through Enfield and connect up with other green spaces. Uh, as you can see, they're quite wild looking, they're not beautifully manicured, but there's lots of space for insects, bugs, you know, it's uh, it's really nice. It was a really nice road to walk along and you're creating a buffer between people and the streets, which I think is also really healthy. Um, these and other things that we can do to green our urban spaces, stop paving over your front garden is one of them. Just, Just a few more seconds, Sarah, by the okay. way. Okay. All right. Sorry. So we can green walls, we can green, um, our pavements, our front gardens, we can add bug refuges and we can use um, rainwater planters that slow down the flow of rainwater. You can do something simple or you can do something nice and funky. It's different. So there we go. That's me. Thank you. I could just ask you to stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Yes, thank you. That's amazing. It's incredible to see all the different, uh, actually all the different things that we can do. And I think it's really showing, I like actually your end note of saying you can make it funky or you can make it simple because I think it is all about 
just really getting creative and actually seeing this as an opportunity of all the things that you can do. And I think, you know, it's coming up a lot of, you know, where do we do this? How is this a problem here? Or is this a problem there? I think a really key element is to start thinking more of our cities as, you know, there's a lot of dead space, actually. There's a lot of spaces that we can do more with. So a lot of, you know, these green deserts, this lawn where nothing's happening actually can be a whole new space. So having that imagination um, and working with people who know um, how to have that imagination of depaving some areas and rewild, well, rewilding specific areas. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I'm actually going to ask Amanda this next question um, of, you know, we're talking about all these different plants and, but I'm curious about, you know, are there any myths or misunderstandings around these plants in our urban spaces? Is there anything that we can dispel quickly so that we can move forward? Um, um, absolutely, yes. I think I think it's not as simple as being that there are good and bad plants. Um, I mean, we've heard today from Bridget on the subject of why dandelions and ivy are absolutely essential for insects. Um, and we've heard from Sarah about how some trees are much better for insects and invertebrates than others are. So um, not all plants are equal. The answer is not to cover huge swathes with some wildflower mix. That's not the answer. The answer is to have lots of different sorts of habitats in a small area, a mosaic, a very fine grained approach. And that will be the thing that increases biodiversity the most of both plants and of invertebrates. Mm, amazing. And I think a last one for everyone. I'm just conscious I want everyone to have time to ask questions and I've seen there's some really good ones in the chat. Um, so what, you know, I think we, you all have this incredible expertise and you're all coming at it from a different perspective in a way. So what do you recommend briefly um, that councils and residents can do to support this urban wildlife? Um, you know, may that be plant and or uh, insect um, and people actually, um, you know, what are some concrete actions that we can do? Uh, as as an audience, as a counselor, um, after seeing this, I'll give it to Sarah first, maybe. Um, well, there's a number of things. I think as individuals, we can stop using pesticides and herbicides. We can nice. stop paving over our front gardens. We can, you know, maybe make space for that that little extra flower that's coming through the pavement and not take it up. Um, I think if you want. Um, to, to really green a, a large sort of space within your community. You can write to your MPs or you can come to Groundwork and see if we've got any funds available because there are an awful lot of grants out there for people to and for communities to, to um, apply for, for greening their spaces. So it's well worth looking at a lot of websites that I think you're going to post some at the end here mm -hmm. so get involved i think get involved and get out there plant some plants and um yeah talk to your mps and amanda and bridget so definitely stop using herbicide i totally agree with that um, and maybe incentivize your residents to take over the management of streets as london borough of lambeth has it's working really well and it means that the, your residents are very engaged and please, please stop tarmacking over tree pits. They, it upsets me so much. Um, it's so unnecessary um, and it's just taking away such a valuable resource. Now, from a personal perspective, we can all notice urban plants, find out what they are, take photos, um, share them. Um, we care so much less about things we don't know the names of. So find out what your local urban plants are tell your families, tell your friends, tell anybody you'll listen, um, get excited about them, find out if you've got a local botanical society. We, we're spoilt here in South London because we have the South London Botanical Institute, which is fabulous. Um, I know there's people from, from there on this call. Um, and if, you're not, if you don't have a local um, society, then join the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, which is also fabulous and has loads of free resources um, to complement this fabulous new pavement plant guide that is being launched today. 
And I would say, you know, send those photos to your council. You know, if you post them on Twitter and at your counselors and, uh, you know, think of social media as, uh, you know, as a really as a space to to share those and those pictures and to celebrate them, but in a in a campaigner perspective. And Bridget, really quickly, just so then we can then have. OK, so, so I'm just going to charge this. I made some notes. So it's so upsetting to come home and find the pavement outside your house has been sprayed. And that could be avoided if people communicated, if councils communicated um, with residents, engaged and listened, so, and advised ahead of any spraying date so that people have an opportunity to say, no, I don't want that, thank you, or to remove the, the, the plants um, if, if they they have to be removed. Um, then, then also use signage. I was thinking um, anyone who's listening, whether you're a, a, a person or a person, a resident or a, a, a councillor, um, look up the More Than Weeds, More Than Weeds um, website and also Plymouth. Check out Plymouth's Rebel Botanist um, just to see about, about um, chalk signage. And the signage can help um, residents um, of, of a road I lived in once. Um, we, we wanted to stop the council from spraying on our road. So a couple of the children in the, the street, a nine year old and a 12 year old made posters. And when you get children involved or if councils want to get the message across to residents, local primary schools, it has a greater impact. Um, write letters of support to your council saying that you enjoy the pavement plants and that you approve of the no pesticides policy if they have one in place. And finally, tell councillors and residents and everybody you know about the um, Pesticide Action Network's pavement plan campaign. Definitely. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> covering some of my boxes. That's really great. Um, I wanted to say, I see some of the questions saying, you know, talking about um sort of uh, alternatives and talking about budgets for councils we're incredibly aware we work with councils across the uk and have meetings with them regularly so any question of that nature we'll send you the resources that we already have you know we have incredibly detailed resources on what uh, alternatives exist and how to make that fit we have cost savings as well you know all these all this is thought out within the very real reality that we know that councils have a very you know tight budget and all this is in the mentality of actually being able to save costs and seeing pavement plants as an opportunity to you know fit into biodiversity um you know uh plans but also actually quite dynamically save money in other places so all this is is things that we're aware of and i don't want to take too much time today for that um, but very briefly, briefly, some little questions that I saw that I found really interesting. Um, the dandelion. I, I love this question. Can dandelions actually damage pavements? Is that what they do, Amanda? Yes, I think that's a yes or no in a way. But. Um, I have, I personally have never seen a pavement damaged by dandelion. I'm happy to be proved wrong, but I've never seen that. I think it's unlikely. Um, yes, I don't particularly want dandelions all over my garden, but I'm very happy to see them in verges and on pavements. And yeah, something that we didn't touch upon is the reality that, you know, a lot of these plants, the fact that they're there is more of a symptom of a crack in, in a pavement that's already there than right. actually the plant creating the crack. Um, so again, that's something that we cover in more depth in the guide. Um, but so yeah, dandelions are just another plant that you know does have deep roots, but it's an opportunity plant. So it will it will grow where it has the space to grow. Um, so someone asking maybe for Sarah about plants that grow in gutters. Um, you know, is that is, you know near drains? Is that a problem? How do we remove those? Or maybe um, not. Remove them, but. Well, I, I guess actually, yes, if they're growing in a gutter, yeah. they are a problem because they're blocking your gutters up and they're stopping the, the movement of water, which will eventually um, end up in your house. So, yes, you probably should get up a ladder or get somebody who's able to get up a ladder and get rid of the plants in the um, in the gutters. But, um, yeah, by all means, leave them in your uh, in your driveway. Mm. Yeah. So, again, if you had a green roof, you wouldn't need a gutter, maybe. So that's the other exactly yeah yeah thinking yes. more strategic you put plants there in the first place where they're mm -hmm. supposed to be in in the situation that they're supposed to be then that's fine um yeah i think what could be yeah so what could be a strong argument to convince a council that leaving wild areas in parks is only the is not is only part of the answer and that pavements are important too so they don't just clean them up i mean 
kind of this event but i'd say the totally different plant species that you get in the the long grass um sort of wild meadows to the plants that you get in in pavement cracks um in the, the, many of the plants that you get in in the pavements and in the walls wouldn't stand a chance um with more of the vigorous um plants in in the meadows but i don't know amanda's probably better able but the only thing i'd say is i mean i did i did send a freedom of information request out to all london councils a couple of years back and one of the things i asked them was how many um complaints they'd had about pavements being left to grow um and um or pavements being cleared um, and of course, what they told us was well, what they told me was that they have loads of well, they, the complaints they do have about are about the plants growing on pavements. But all the people who are happy with the plants are not telling the councils that they're happy and they don't want them cleared. So back to Bridget's point about write loads of letters. Yes, tell tell them that you're happy if they leave the pavement to grow for a bit. Tell them you really like it because they won't know. And I, having worked in local authorities, I know that you you're picking up what comes into you. So if you, if you don't, if people don't tell you they like things, you just don't know that. Yeah, I think that's a a great place to wrap up questions a little bit, just because I'm seeing questions that I can answer as a, as a closing up. Um, but that yes, the the real thing is communication, right? Communication from the council about these plans. And this guide, I hope now you can see, is an opportunity for councillors to get more information about what's growing on their streets because a lot of them don't have residence ecologists, they don't have botanists at their hands. So this guide is an attempt to really give a resource to councillors to actually know what's there and to then be able to communicate themselves to residents, you know, and put up signs and really celebrate what's growing there and tell them it's for biodiversity. And in turn for residents as well to write to your council, tell them, you know, this is something that we want to see, tell them we want deep paved areas, we want, you know, green roofs, all these initiatives. Um, and we're here to advise them on how to do that in a cost effective way. And, you know, we're a charity for free. Um, but yeah, I'm going to wrap up and, and sort of tell people where you can find the guide now. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. I thank you so much, Bridget, Amanda, Sarah, for your for your wisdom. I think this really shows there is an incredible wealth of information out there. And it's, you know, it's just go go to Amanda's walks. So actually on Saturday, Sunday, if you're in London, there are two walks happening. There's one on Saturday in Brixton, one on Sunday in Shoreditch. Um, it's a super discounted walk. They're often a lot more expensive and this is donation based. So, you know, cost shouldn't be um, a hamper, but please do come along if you're in London to actually in person uh, get that knowledge and we can uh, tweet you, Bridget, to Cornwall to show if we find any great species. Um, and, you know, get involved with these initiatives. So, you know, this guide is part of the Pesticide Free Towns initiative. So, you know, if you can't come to the walk Saturday, Sunday, you can be a campaigner or you can just take photos of the plants that you do see and send them to your counselor. Um, but yeah, there's, there's loads of ways to be involved from the little to the big. So hopefully we, we've we inspired you to care about your, your neighbors. May those be plants or insects or people and to really start thinking about how how do you want to see your cities and how how are we going to start facing climate change at our doorstep um and i think i'll i'll close it there thank you so much everyone thank you to our speakers thank you, thank you. and any outstanding questions that you still have um we'll we'll try and answer them in the follow up email and we'll send you all the resources and of course we'll send you the guide i think the key issue uh we will send you the guide in the follow up and that will be online um as well uh pavement plants um on our website. But thank you everyone and yeah, thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.